uh, let me back up. The FRP is basically comprised of two separate um, items. So one is a, a dry fiber and the other is an epoxy matrix. So the fiber can either be carbon or glass or aramid fibers. Uh, they all have different tensile properties. And they're essentially applied to the surface of uh, existing structures to provide additional tensile capacity. Um, the blending of the epoxy and the fiber is what makes it a composite in nature. Um, so how they typically work, so there's a, a few different methods of application for fi uh, for FRP. It could either be wet layup applied or dry layup applied. Uh, at the end of the day, it's basically just a, a fit over function of how you're going to apply the product, but it will service in the same way either, either way. So typically you're going to go through and prep the surface of the concrete structure that you're going to apply the FRP to. And the FRP is going to be uh, the Basically, the, the concrete surface is going to be ground down with a grinder to a CSP2, which is a surface profile. It's something almost like a, a textured sandpaper, so it's nothing too extreme. Um, then the fiber is going to be uh, either wet laid out, which is it's cut into strips. The epoxy is basically poured over it in a bath. The fiber is going to be fully saturated in the epoxy, and then it's wet hung onto the actual structure itself. Um, I cringe when I say this, but it's sort of like hanging wallpaper. So if you ever worked with wallpaper in the past, you'll understand that it's basically just troweled on and it's smoothed out to take any voids and bubbles out of it. After it's fully cured, uh, it's actually a rigid structure and it's able to supplement the steel in the actual structure itself. Um, fiber is really good for um, more or less mixed use or renovation of projects. So for instance, if you have an old mill and let's say that the existing slab capacity is 100 pounds per square foot. Well, maybe we want to make it into luxury apartments and it has to now be 125 pounds per square foot, something along those lines. We can actually use fiber to help increase the capacity that's required because of the change of use of the structure. Um, there are other alternate methods. Um, you can use steel or you can actually put down more rebar and concrete, but all those things add a lot of weight and, and actually you know, lower your head clearance, things like that within the structure. So fiber can be a really good use um, as an alternative method for some of those uh, strengthening applications. Uh, so some of the limitations with FRP are um, the way it's actually applied. So it's bonded to the surface of the existing structure, right? So we're basically relying on the intimate contact of that epoxy to the concrete structure itself. So if the structure is itself is not um, in good shape, then that that's going to be a relying factor of where the failure is going to happen within the fiber. The fiber is stronger than steel. Uh, it's you know it's it's much stronger than concrete. So the failure mechanism is actually within the concrete surface itself. So the problem is um, the concrete is only as good. I'm sorry, the fiber is only as good as the, the substrate that it's being bonded to. So ACI 440 is an engineering technical guideline that's basically used for FRP um, for, for engineers to reference whenever they're, they're designing with FRP. So it goes the gamut from design. It also talks about surface prep, talks about installation, contractor qualifications, all, all the different aspects of uh, installing FRP. One of the big drawbacks is it doesn't talk about if the concrete substrate isn't adequate for FRP installation in the first place. So which can obviously become a large issue. So if there's active corrosion on the concrete itself, or if there's other issues underlying, basically what it says right now is to remediate those issues so it now meets the criteria. Um, the two big benchmarks that they talk about within FRP reinforcement are the pull-off test and then the concrete compressive strength of the existing structure. So concrete compressive strength is typically 3,000 PSI. I'm sure people have heard about that, or 4,000. The bottom benchmark for uh, FRP reinforcements is 2,500 PSI concrete. That's um, currently the, the big issue is in the ACI 440 is it's not variable. So they leave that as a benchmark. Um, the other uh, benchmark is 200 PSI for pull tests. So ACI calls for essentially um, the contractors to do a pull test prior to doing any installation of FRP on site. So they have to do, uh, it's more or less a 50 millimeter dolly that gets glued to the concrete substrate and it's pulled off with a, an instrument, I mean, excuse me, a posit tester, uh, and it gives you a particular load rating. So the benchmark is 200. So at this point, 
if for some reason you're hitting a level of less than 200 on that pull test, you're going to be in trouble, right? The, the engineer's already gone through and performed all the designs for the fiber based on this 200 PSI, but the real life test on site, if we're only hitting 175 PSI, what happens then? You can run into quite a few issues on site. So a little bit about just standard concrete uh, deterioration. So deterioration surface balls, they're all, they are all activated essentially by water and oxygen being infiltrated into the rebar. The rebar then swells, just like any typical uh, delamination and micro cracking happens when the, that rebar swells um, and you're gonna get surface, de uh, surface expansion and delamination. The big issue that we can run into is if these concrete beams have been reinforced with fiber and this corrosion is happening behind the fiber, then we have to deal with either removing that fiber, then repairing the concrete, and then rebearing the concrete, and then rewrapping the fiber. So it becomes extremely costly if that corrosion wasn't addressed prior to the fiber being installed. <clears throat> so the delamination of FRP due to corrosion, as I more or less just mentioned. So the corrosion is going to happen within the actual structure. If that corrosion is now um, occurring behind the fiber, the fiber is going to actually sort of encapsulate the beam. A lot of times engineers will determine to decide maybe we, we wrap and have spaces in between these strips of fiber so we can have areas where we can monitor the actual health of the beam behind the uh, structure. If they do that, we can still run to issues where the delaminations can be occurring in between the fiber, and now we, we're still running into the same issue. So we're going to have to strip this fiber off, remove the, the concrete, patch back, and then reinforce with more fiber after. So ideally, we want to treat the entire beam prior to actually installing the fiber at all. So this is where it's a little bit different from what the existing structure is. <clears throat> so if there's corrosion in certain areas, engineers are going to call for these areas to be chipped back, removed, sounded. You're going to repair, build back the surface. That's all well and good. But we want to make sure that we're also treating the underlying areas all the way down the beams for corrosion. That's where this is a little bit different from our typical means and methods because everyone's been on the highway before where you see a patch in an area and right next to it, there's another patch on a concrete column or a beam, right? Because the corrosion is just expanding out from where the original corrosion was happening. So the, the idea is to make sure that we neutralize and pacify all the corrosion within the beam prior to wrapping it with FRP in the first place. Uh, we've had some issues or we've seen issues on site where, as I mentioned, uh, we're going to have columns that are wrapped with glass fiber. So a lot of times you'll wrap a column for just confinement. There's really not a lot of strength required for it, but uh, the, the glass fiber is actually starting to blister in, and push out because there's active corrosion happening in that column behind the glass, um, and it's causing localized delaminations where now that fiber isn't engaged to the actual structure. It's just more or less uh, hanging onto that delaminated piece of concrete on the outside, not doing what it was designed to do. Turn this down a little bit. Um, so this is just a, a video more or less showing. I'll mute that. So I don't know if you guys can hear me talk over it. Um, this is a saturation machine. So this gentleman's actually applying um, the liquid epoxy to uh, a drive roll of carbon fiber. And this is for a, a pipe job. Pipes are also very important. We use carbon fiber in pipes all the time. But again, if our host pipe is not not structurally sound, then we're going to run into issues with with uh, localized delaminations and micro cracking inside. And this is just a like I said, a standard video of how fiber is applied to a pipe itself. The benefit the fiber is it can be installed in tight spaces. So you can see here these two gentlemen are in a pipe that's maybe 60 inches or 72 inch diameter pipe and they're wrapping in the hoop direction with unidirectional fiber. So as I said before, it's kind of like hanging wallpaper. Um, and again, this is only as good as the bond to the substrate that's being applied to. 
So it's important to make sure that that substrate is sound. And there's no active corrosion occurring within that substrate. So what we've developed ourselves is uh, we have a Serco uh, FRP primer, which it's a two part primer that's basically used one to help neutralize any corrosion that's occurring within the substrate and two to densify the existing concrete to help increase the overall tensile yield strength of the concrete. So the first layer goes on uh, and is they're both spray applied, which is makes it very easy for uh, applicators to install. So the first layer is spray applied. It migrates in the vapor phase and it basically goes back to the rebar that's existing in the structure and bonds onto the rebar um, and creates a passive film to stop and eliminate any corrosion from occurring in those areas. The second layer is also spray applied. As I said, it's going to actually react with the, the cement phase of the concrete to densify that outer three inch uh, concrete cover within the structure. Um, we do have a specification for the FRP primer as well. It's based off the UFGS specification that we have for some of our products. Um, and here's just a, a standard list of, of some of the extra benefits that we have for this product. Um, so as I said, it increases the tensile yield strength of the concrete. Um, it's going to re minimize the amount of concrete repair that's going to be required in the future because we're going to neutralize all the corrosion that's happening in the beams, even outside of the areas where the, the original spalls uh, occurred. And it's going to inhibit and prevent any corrosion and also removes the chlorides that are in the structure as it is. So we had an interesting project uh, for Pennsylvania DOT uh, where we went out and per ACI standard, we did pull tests prior to installing any FRP on the substrate. And as you can see the before numbers here, we're getting nothing more than 105 PSI pull tests on the existing concrete substrate. So at this point, FRP should not be applied to this, this substrate. They either have to understand how to develop something with steel or somehow remediate the existing surface concrete to try and bring that, that substrate up to the appropriate capacity. The applicator went in and applied the Circo FRP primer to the surface and was able to actually test. And now, as you can see, we're getting 250 PSI difference for some of these pull tests. We're getting up around 360 when, again, the minimum barrier of entry is 200 PSI that's required. So this is a really nice um, benefit for our applicators as well as general contractors and engineers, because this is able to, which could have been a, a tremendous problem on site, this was able to remediate the entire solution and make sure that fiber was actually still be able to be installed on the on the, the overall structure. So as you can see here, you know, the cost, the cost of, of repairing the concrete, chipping out all that bad concrete, rebuilding it, and then also having to wrap after could be upwards of $500 a square foot for concrete repair. The FRP primer is installed for a dollar a square foot, and it took seven days for it to react since it does uh, flow in both the uh, ionic and the migratory phases in the vapor phase, excuse me. Um, it took about seven days, and then the, health, the substrate health was high enough, the compressor strength was high enough, we were able to do the pull tests and get those readings that we needed to be able to go forward and to apply the FRP. Uh, this is just our standard. Uh, this is actually the details within PennDOT, excuse me. So PennDOT does a great job because they say right here that if there's active corrosion already happening, that it has to be uh, arrested prior to any kind of FRP. Um, we've worked on some jobs in the Midwest, uh, some municipal projects where they, it, it's great, they use FRP. They go through and they want to uh, reinforce these beams and they wrap the ends, but they don't mention or talk about any of the corrosion that's happening. And the reason why these beam ends are all being uh, degraded and corroding are because of the active corrosion in that structure. So repairing it and then wrapping it, it's going to work for now. It'll provide the additional capacity that we're looking for, but we're still going to run into the issue down the road where this corrosion could come back because it hasn't been arrested elsewhere within the structure itself. Uh, another project that we worked on was LaGuardia Airport for the uh, Delta, the new Delta terminal. So for this one, we put the primer on. Uh, we didn't have any issues with the uh, PSI ratings up front, but again, just the belts and suspenders, it's better to have the primer applied and then to wrap um, versus not, and then run to issues afterwards. So you can see here that we had a 420 PSI pull uh, prior to the FRP primer being installed. Afterward, we were able to gain up to a 540 PSI pull on those tensile yield. 
and that's uh, more or less the the overall. Let me go back to the front page here. Um, if anyone has questions uh, as far as the FRP primer, um, how it works with the corrosion, um, I don't know if 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 cost and if people have been either messaging on there or if you want to give them uh, my email after. We have specifications for this as well. Um, as I said, the, the the big benefit on the sales side of this is it's relatively inexpensive uh, when it comes to a cost per square foot um, compared to what actually the cost of installing FRP is. So just as a, a benchmark, you know, typically FRP is going to be installed from anywhere from $30 a square foot up to $100 a square foot based on wages and design and those kind of things. And applying the FRP primer over the surface of that for another dollar a square foot is a tremendous safety net to make sure that there's no issues down the road for the for the overall structure. Yeah, thank you for that presentation, Greg. Um, yeah, if anybody has any questions, um, you know, for Greg about the project, anything like that, uh, just go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question, and we'll be happy to uh, start answering some. Um, Greg, could you uh, sort of summarize again the uh, advantages of using FRP primer as one attempting to sell it to a uh, customer might use to explain it. Some of them are obvious, you know, uh, avoiding any potential for having to do uh, more extreme measures to gain the uh, tensile strength for application, which is always required to do. And we show we can bring it up above 200. But what, what might be how we explain the value of going up above, like taking it from 200 up to 400 and um, how is this also can be viewed I guess from the point of view that concrete not being uniform so you run a pull out test on one spot and uh, so it's weak at another and how is the failure normally observed if you do have too low of a tensile strength and to what extent have uh, people doing carbon fiber taking steps to compensate for, for a potentially low tensile strength? Yeah, that's a great question. So so if we're if we're achieving or if we're hitting a low tensile strength on some of these projects, typically it all rolls back to into into a redesign with uh, the engineer. So they can implement uh, you know either carbon fiber anchors or maybe a mechanical fastening system because they're trying to develop and spread out the load. Um, unfortunately, I, I, we've been on projects and I've been on projects where they try and put more fiber up, which isn't really solving the underlying problem, right? Because it's not the, the, the capacity of the fiber, but it's the interface of the substrate to the fiber itself. That's the problem that we're, that's, uh, that's the limiting factor, right? Um, so when we do these pull tests and we're getting too low a strength, um, you know, from what I've seen, typically, they're going to put some sort of a mechanical anchoring system in, something that they can try and pin and develop that fiber back into the substrate. The big issue that we see with that is it's going to go back to the engineer for redesign. They come out and take a look at it. Um, it's It costs a lot of time and a lot of uh, just duration for that to actually happen on site. Uh, you know, if, if that's the problem, you're going to get a field fix that could take, you know, seven to ten business days before the guys can continue to move forward and, and finish the, the reinforcement schedule. So it's valuable to keep the project on schedule if you have a problem with strength. Um, can you may explain a little bit how uh, the tensile strength interacts with the carbon fiber and concrete causing a monolithic structure with respect to the surface area that you're covering with the carbon fiber? Right, so so typically fiber is only going to be applied to areas where there's a high strength component required. So um, you can almost think of it as if you're you're casting a beam. Uh, there's shear stirrups on the ends, so the fiber is going to be applied to those same same areas and same ends. But unfortunately, the way that fiber is developed now, uh, again, it's only based on the interface. So we're 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 in hopes we're, we're covering the surface with shear reinforcement. Let's say it's a vertical U-wrap at the beam end. Um, but 
typical design calls for 100% coverage, perhaps, right? So we're going to completely cover that beam end with carbon fiber. Well, you know, now we have a five foot area that's completely closed off uh, for visual inspection, but the top of the beam, it could be a joint that runs over the top of the beam or something on those lines where water and moisture can still get in and that corrosion is still going to be active in the back behind this area. So now we have no way of understanding and visually monitoring the ends of these beams, um, which can be very problematic. So if putting the primer up, it's going to help us to neutralize the corrosion up front then we don't have to worry about that. And also we typically try to advise engineers to, to have the FRP wrapped in spaces. So there are those visual representation areas. So we can actually look in and monitor, make sure that there's no issues that are happening. So you might want to mention that the inhibitor we put down that if you use the inhibitor, it's a two part system. And uh, you're applying the one part for the strength and then one part for the corrosion. It's the same migratory corrosion inhibitor that we use on the reinforced concrete. And we have a tremendous amount of experience with it and its performance. And uh, treating the whole beam, then you totally avoid the problem. And if you're worried about water, you can even treat the whole beam because the uh, primer, besides increasing tensile strength, it also improves the compressive and resist uh, water penetration. So you have a lot of positives that go in to cover a myriad of potential problems that you're just pointed out there, Greg. Right, and, and I mean, I, one big issue that we that I've seen are typical spall repair details where they say to square off a patch, uh, remove the bad concrete in that area, and then treat the inside of that voided space, that, that uh, chipped up area, with uh, maybe with a corrosion inhibitor, but they don't expand that corrosion inhibitor out to the, the surrounding areas. So now that area is good. We can all agree that there's gonna be no corrosion in that certain spalled area, but all the areas around it are gonna increase in corrosive activity because they're right next to uh, the new patch and it's becomes uh, an issue down the road where, you know, again, we have one spall in one area and right next to it, five years later, they're chipping out the concrete, and removing it. Yeah, that was what you call that the halo effect. Remember, it's uh, <laughs> the uh, with a new patch area, you've gone into a very high and cathodic condition versus a still in an anodic condition in the surrounding concrete. So you increase the uh, potential difference, which will accelerate corrosion going out away from the patch area. That's why they call it a halo around the patch. And uh, so many of these things are overlooked. And it's amazing the myriad of uh, selling points that are here that we may want to uh, highlight. Um, but very good. I have no more questions. Thank you, Bob. And just so everybody knows, that was Bob Waldy, our, our chief technical officer. I had a couple of questions. Is the floor still open? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, so this is Dan Berg with Phase One Shoreline. Um, we, um, I, I, I totally understand, and this makes a lot of sense. You want to bring up that tensile strength and, and uh, that that strength of the interface because that's if that fails, everything fails. Um, a couple of questions on the um, the application. I, are you saying a dollar a square foot per application? Um, that seems a little low um, compared to applying other materials like this. Um, are you suggesting one application or is this multiple applications? No, so we'd only have to apply each product once. Uh, so it would probably be a dollar a square foot per layer uh, for the for the step one and the step two. Uh, and again, I guess the price can vary depending on where the application is going to actually occur. So if it's somewhere like Manhattan where we have a higher wage rate, um, you know, the, the cost could uh, increase slightly, but the cost of the material is only about a dollar a square foot. So it's um, okay. for the coverage rate. Yeah. So for one application, you you feel you get enough 
uh, penetration uh, to get deep enough to get the corroded areas. Correct. Okay. Yep. It's a migrating corrosion right. inhibitor, so it continues its migration path, um, you know, long after we're done, but it's it's driven in initially with water. So if you have a vertical application, you know, you might need a little more because your, you know, your waste would be a little higher. Understood. Okay, that, that, that puts in perspective a little bit, so appreciate that. Um, was also curious. Um, you know, having a chemical background, I'm, you know, look, I get into the weeds, so maybe this is too deep, but um, do you have any kind of, a primer typically has a bonding, a covalent bonding mechanism. Um, this looks like you're really just focusing on bringing up the, the density of the surface concrete. Are you relying totally on mechanical interlocking uh, for the adhesion of, of the wet fiber, or do you have some kind of functionality in the primer to bond covalently with the epoxy. I, I don't know, Greg, you want me to take that? I'll, I'll try. It might be a question it. for Bob. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, there's, there's no uh, established covalent uh, chemistry going on. Um, the, uh, the epoxy, uh, of course, you get pretty good bond strength with concrete. The, you've never, the, Failure is never the epoxy bond. No, okay. And then pull off. It's always concrete coming off attached to the epoxy. And uh, what we're doing uh, chemistry-wise, we're putting something in that uh, reactivates the uh, concrete chemical curing process to increase strength. So we're increasing uh, a multiplicity of strength vectors through compression, did we lose Bob? I think we lost Bob there. I, I somehow he faded off. No, I finish talking. Okay. Oh, my microphone's on. <laughs> you didn't hear me. I'm here. Hear me. So Dan, does that answer your does that answer your question? Very clearly. Thank you. Perfect. We've been in the just just as a course of record. We've been in the fiber business for uh, you know more than twenty years. So this is something. It, it's one of the reasons we actually acquired Surtreat because we had a a very a, a very strong fiber business, but we recognized a huge need to um, improve the substrate health prior to installation of our fiber. And in fact, um, when we merged these companies, it was specifically to benefit and and to you know set ourselves way above uh, uh, you know by providing FRP solutions that would outlast those. And as as Bob and Greg both pointed out earlier, certainly the timing you know getting it done and not having to stand on the side of a highway while some engineer comes out and measures things and takes chloride samples and everything was a was a big initiative. So it's really enabled us to uh, set ourselves apart from uh, people that don't uh, consider the substrate health. And, and we've also worked very closely with engineers to really kind of bring them more up to speed on, on getting that substrate uh, you know how important it is just like painting just like and wallpaper just like anything if your substrate's not in proper condition whatever you're applying to it will have a shortened life um, so i'm curious um this sounds like a very uh, elegant solution for a lot of problems we've seen and um we've never sold a project like this um curious what kind of uh, pushback or resistance do you see when trying to sell a project like this? Well, typically the engineers, you know, when, when the engineers realize that it's such a insignificant amount, I mean, typically FRP, a, a completed, you know, FRP solution 
is is at a minimum around twenty to twenty five dollars a square foot. Just you know, driven by the the cost of carbon, of course, right? It's 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 significant, and then of course the labor and and things like that, and that doesn't include the concrete repair. But um, you know, initially there's been oh my gosh, but then when they realize that you're talking about you know uh, uh, such a, an insignificant amount. Uh, to be added to the overall cost that usually that goes away. It's really, um, you know, uh, we bid the jet we, for, for over a year. We actually, we give this away without it being specified because we felt it made such a difference. Our, our FRP crews were able to install faster. We had less waste and we had absolutely zero callbacks and we were providing additional services so in mm. reality biggest pushback is going to be from other contractors or manufacturers that haven't tested their systems with corrosion inhibitors <laughs> um you know uh, uh but uh, engineers are are more and more opening themselves up to it in fact i know greg has even been working with aci to some degree to get them to ensure that there's a minimum substrate health so uh we've used this um on very high profile projects uh, in, for the federal government, and and uh, so far, so far it is it's being accepted. But everybody knows in the public world things take a long time to get changed. So the biggest barrier is just getting the word out to these engineers that this very inexpensive uh, solution and and performance enhancer is available. Okay, so really, it's an education challenge. It really yeah. is, and and well, we can here, help bro. you with that. So uh, what you're looking at is every oh, this all starts with an engineer deciding you have a structural insufficiency that needs to be corrected. So the question is, uh, if it's in a, a structural beam issue, what are the options? And there are a number. And what are the different ways in which engineers view it? Uh, one of the options is to uh, stick in a, a steel beam, reinforce the whole structure. That's done. The other option is they view it as the uh, what's really ha they view it's happened is the bond between the concrete and the rebar has failed due to corrosion. So you come in, chip away the concrete, and repour concrete on to, with a, a form around the uh, rebar. Now we've seen all of these types of uh, structural fixtures employed in uh, parking garages and on bridges. So. But the issue is always how do you engineers away from the uh, this is the way we've always done it concept to move uh, from uh, the other two beams and repair of beams to uh, FRP. And then if they're doing FRP to recognize the value of, of improving tensile strength with respect to how that increases the overall monolithic strength of the beam, then you can calculate that. You just take what's what's the increase of 200 square feet per gallon, you know, per, per 200 square feet per inch over uh, a uh, two by four strip of uh, reinforced FRP. It's a lot of surface area that you've now increased bond strength of that, which is the weakest link in the whole uh, system. So it's, it's always a matter of selling things against alternatives, and that's that's where we are with all of Surtree products. That we're selling against the alternatives, many of which are cast out there due to prior history. And in some instances, uh, the uh, people responsible for maintaining the uh, facility. Um, just ignore the problem until it gets to the point where you have to either tear it down or rebuild it. I mean, right now there's a bridge across the Potomac in Washington, D.C., the Roosevelt Bridge, main highway going from Virginia to D.C. They had to cut, cut a lane on each side. So that causes traffic jams because of corrosion of steel structures as they, in their minds has reduced the load bearing character of it. 
Well, if you look at it, I go by, I can see it if I go in on the train into Washington, the train tracks go right adjacent to it. Probably about 10% uh, of the total steel <laughs> is suffering 90% of the structural damage. So if you could get in there early and just treat that, you would eliminate all these problems. The, the, and it's the same thing as with uh, structural beams. Many instances, uh, I think, as uh, people have seen where they go in, they're going to look at FRP. The condition of the beam is beyond re the point where you could do anything because it has so many cracks and loose concrete in it. You know, to what extent have we seen that in the past, Greg? All the time. Well, I'm looking at uh, the propensity for the people, particularly in the municipal arena, to ignore for long periods of time corrosion damage, whether it's in steel, steel beams or reinforced concrete. And I've seen some cases where the condition of a concrete beam became so compromised with delamination that uh, you, there is nothing, there's no surface substrate strong enough to adhere anything to because you have such a high degree of delamination from the rebar. So there are some instances that where it won't work because of that. If the concrete is loose and you adhere the carbon fiber to it, then there's no way that you transmit that additional strength into the beam to create a monolithic structural system. And that's the way it has to be looked at. It has to be looked at it monolithically it is the combination of concrete and rebar. Where concrete's high in compression, but weak in tension. Steel's strong in tension, but weak in compression. But all of that monolithic nature is dependent upon the extent that the rebar and the concrete are bonded to one or the other. So then any strains can be transmitted from one to the other. And the same thing's true with carbon fiber. It has to be bonded such that its reinforcement can be transmitted into the beam. If you don't have a good bond, you can't transmit it. And if the concrete is loose, with respect to uh, the rest of the beam, you're not transmitting it. So there, there's a lot of factors in uh, trying to get people to understand that early intervention is critical. And I would say that's the biggest problem with the deterioration of our infrastructure is the, watching it decay and then only doing something once it's beyond the point where you, if you don't do something, you're in a condition of potential structural collapse. Or you have a collapse like the bridge in Pittsburgh. So that's my speech on that subject. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. I hope that may give some set some light on the uh, holistic problem that we're dealing with here with respect to alternatives, condition at the time you're attempting to do something to remediate, the options for remediation, remediation being arresting the underlying cause, restoration being putting things back into appropriate structural condition. It's the combination of FRP primer and carbon fiber where we bring together uh, remediation and restoration simultaneously. Those are two key words, remediation and restoration. That's what we and, do. And Bob, if, I, if, if I may just say, and anybody that needs assistance in, in getting a specification, we have a general specification for this that we, we provide, we can provide you. And it, typically you can use that when talking to an engineer. Um, you know, a lot of times they like to see it all written out for them with all the references and testing and things. So, so you know, anytime if if one of you have a meeting with an engineer, we can provide you that. If that engineer is is considering 
offering an FRP solution, we'd be more than happy to work with you to help educate that engineer or owner. You know, to, we found owners really like these these ideas because uh, they're the ones that ultimately pay the price. Because as we know, in construction, people don't typically offer very long-term warranties. So uh, typically, it's the owner who's left in the straits when a solution only lasts a couple of years. So just know that you know, we stand ready to assist. Jules, what's the warranty on this, basically? Well, again, because there's so many factors that go into each solution, we we can't we can't give you a general warranty. Okay. Although we'll tell you that you know all of the times we've ever installed uh, FRP with this, we've gotten increased pull-off strengths. You know, we've gotten uh, 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 we have purged contaminants, um, things like that. So so again. All things considered, a, a, a good FRP solution, if the substrate health is taken care of, should last, I mean, should extend at 50 years at a minimum. I mean, although you're not warranting that, but uh, I, we can pretty much guarantee you the using our solution, the FRP will not take, uh, you know, will not debond from the substrate. Okay. But again, it's a 50 year, it's a 50 year service life extension, wouldn't you say, Greg? Yeah, I mean, especially with FRP, it's designed for a 50 year life. So again, it really comes down to the, the fiber will be in service as long as that concrete is still robust and, and in good service length. So the FRP primer is going to help ensure that. Uh, Julie, this is Dan Berg again. Quick question. If we need some support or have questions with regard to you know, positioning this with an owner or an engineer. Um, what? Who's our go-to point person for support? Greg, is that that's going to be you for now, uh, or your team, Greg? Or do you want to? I mean, Dan, we'll get you back with an exact name. Um, I know you're part of the Seawall Repair Network, right? So I know that that Correct. was a little iffy. I know Max, you've worked with Max, but we'll get you We'll get you an exact, uh, you know, who can come out and help you and who can, uh, I, it's it's going to go through Greg's department. I think we just need to know, Greg, you need to probably assign someone. It's probably, uh, Max is in Canada, so he doesn't travel as easily, but, you know, we, we will definitely, right. um, I think reach out to Greg and then we'll make certain we get you the right support. And, and the reason I'm asking is we are in the process of it, it looks likely to happen where we're going to do a strategic partnership with a pretty large um, concrete restoration company. And, you know, they already do things like this, but I think um, we're trying to consolidate on technologies and, and suppliers. And I think we're going to have a lot more opportunities to place uh, these kinds of things outside of just you know what we typically focus on so um trying to get our resources lined out so i know how to how to do this uh, efficiently and, and the solutions that we provide you know with through the seawall repair network you know it, it, while it's the same technology there are variations for those specific things so you know dan we'll definitely get back to you we've been talking about that we have had several um uh seawall repair network contractors that do more than seawalls and right. are you know looking to see what value we have so we will most definitely reach back out to you guillermo i think you're on this phone call right we will most definitely reach back out to you and provide you a, a way to, to do that, you know, to become one of the certified applicators outside of just the seawall. Fantastic. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you. We appreciate you guys, uh, you attending and your interest. Well, if there's no more questions, Greg, I guess it's back up to you to close it out. Yeah, thank you for everybody's time. Uh, I think Costin has the attendance list. So Costin, if you want to send out my contact information to everybody on the list, if they have questions, uh, either I can provide answers or uh, I'll reach out to someone else internally in surgery to make sure that we can get those answers for you. Hey, Greg, here, question, Mario, uh, is this available as a PowerPoint your presentation? I was I was just going to say that. So uh, after this call, we were going to we're going to uh, release the presentation to our agents and applicators, uh, which I think uh, everyone on the call remaining is an agent or applicator. So we'll send we'll send you guys this along with some marketing material for the primer, uh, the specification for the FRP and primer. 
So, um, so yeah, we'll we'll be we'll be sharing this uh, for you guys. Great, thanks. Hey, hey Gamble, hey, Gamble, Gamble. Uh, Mario, is, is Greg's voice over? Uh, will be a as part of an overall presentation, or is it just strictly the PowerPoint with no uh, no voiceover? Um, we can. I, we recorded this, so I, I guess okay. we can make both of. Just wondering, that's all. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody. God bless. Thank you.